All right, praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to see you all today. A new year. It's a new season. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you are here. And, um, you know, it's another opportunity, another day, another hour to get things right. You know, we may have messed up in the things in the past, but now we have a new opportunity to get it right. And turn the calendar flipping over to 2024 should have nothing to do with you making changes in your life. This should be a daily thing that we do. And so we should celebrate life every day. You know, we have the big whoop to do at the end of the year with the drop of the ball, the peach, or whatever people do, would do uh, to celebrate the new year. But we need to celebrate every day, every day in the Lord. I have a great message in store today, but before we get into it, um, i just like to remind everyone who's watching and listening um, to visit, I want to say visit tm-church.com, that's Transformation Ministries' website. i also like to mention that we are a teaching ministry because I want people to be in the know. I want people to know truth, and if you don't think I'm bringing the truth, then let me know your version of it, and we can discuss it. We can chop it up and, and make sure that we're in the Word and not with feelings or opinions and beliefs but that is, is based off the absolute truth, which is the word of God. <clears throat> and there's three things that I always want to uh, put out here during each service and that I want you to receive, and that is what the Bible says and what the Bible means, which is important. And I just want to say but what it means and then how to apply it to your life. That's the important part. Why even be here? Why even tune in if you're not looking to change your life for the better? to be in the will of God. And that's what we're all about here. And that's why I teach the messages. So let me take a moment to pray for the service and also for the message that I'm about to bring. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord God. Thank you for allowing us to come together in person and also virtually, Lord God. But with it being virtually, we have another opportunity to watch it again and again and Lord God, so help us, Lord God, to be able to do that and to make sure that we have it. And also, Lord God, uh, put it on the minds and, and hearts of people to share the information so that other people can also hear what uh, you have given me to present today. So Lord God, bless all of those who are listening and watching and learning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Today's message, I have titled this message, Love your enemies. And this is probably one of the hardest things that anyone can do, is to love your enemy. And I, that's what I'm going to challenge you with this message today, is to love your enemies. You're probably thinking, I can't, I, I know this person who did this certain thing, I, uh, -uh. I can't love them. I don't care what you say, but don't take my word for it. Let's look, we're going to see what God says about the matter. So I want you all to tune in and listen, listen carefully. So why is it so hard to love your enemy? Uh, I can answer that question by the definition of what an enemy is. I'm going to put it on the screen. There's uh, different definitions that I gathered and put together uh, to make up, to make it more thorough. So an uh, enemy feels hatred towards you. An enemy fosters harmful schemes against you. An enemy engages in antagonistic activities hostile to you. And the characteristics of an enemy include anger, hatred, frustration, envy, jealousy, fear, and distrust. So it is understandable that if a person is your enemy, that they hate you. Yeah. Hate is a strong word. But so is love. So, so it's also understandable to me, though, when I say that the enemy hates you based off the definition that we have on the screen here. Uh, it's understandable that you will hate them in return. We are Christians, but still we hate people, right? Sure, not supposed to. Amen to that. However, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you are not to hate those that hate you. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but we're not to do it. In fact, you are to love those who hate you. 
you are to love your enemies. So let's look at the scripture. Like I said, don't take my word for it. Let's take God's word for it. It's a lengthy scripture coming from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. It says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. God has no respect to a person. He makes the, the sun to rise and shine on everyone. And he sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. It's not just raining on people who, who just want to water their grass and their fields and their crops. It's going to rain on anyone because that's what God does. He's not going to separate that when he pour out his blessings. So, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? There's no reward in that. That's easy to do. It comes natural. Do not even the publicans the same, and I guess the reason they mentioned the publicans is because they're the tax collectors. And, and these publicans they talk about here, they, they make a profit. They make money off of people because they add a little interest to it. So, even if they, then, you know, they do the same thing. That kind of people do. So, and if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? But ye therefore perfect, even as your father, is it be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. We got to work at it. We got to work at it. It is easy to love those who love you, but not so much for those who hate you. And I, it's, like I said, based off the definition, uh, it's understandable why it's uh, not easy. I mean, why it's easy to, to uh, it's easy to love the ones who love you, but it's hard to love those who hate you. When Jesus said that you are to love your enemies, what he was doing there, he was creating a standard for relationships. Because in any relationship, whether friends, whether family, whether spouses, whether siblings, I mean, there's, there's going to be friction. But that don't make them your enemy. But I know of a lot of, in a lot of households, they are enemies. Sometimes between spouses. That was a movie that came out, Sleeping with the Enemy, where the, the, the spouse, I'm talking about this this husband, mm -hmm. and, you've seen that book, husband and wife, but it was he was like the enemy. And now they even coined a phrase uh, called, called frenemies. Mm -hmm. These friends that you have, they, but sometimes they like they act like enemies, so they call them frenemies. So you are to have loving feelings toward your enemies. But how do you do that? Let's go to the scripture. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 30, it says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer the other, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, Forbid not to take thy coat also. Somebody gonna take my scalp, my scarf and say, "Here, here is my coat too." But we know that's not easy to do. So I'm just reading the scripture. Give to every man that asketh thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. So we are to love those who mistreat us, who despitefully disrespect us, deceive us, hurt us, mock us. So how do you go about loving your enemies? Perhaps the first thing you should do is love uh, to do in order to love your enemies is to analyze yourself. Sometimes you got to look at you. Look at the man or woman in the mirror. 
Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. And why beholdest thou the mote or the speck that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam, big old plank two by four, big stick sticking out of your eye that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the motes out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. You, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the motes out of your brother's eye. So you got to fix yourself. You can't go around trying to uh, hate on people or or judge people because their sin is different from yours. You got to look at yourself. You know, I've seen people talking about when well, he do drugs all the time. Like, well, you're an alcoholic, but I don't do drugs. You know, but you got to look at yourself. Clean yourself up, then you can better judge their sin. I just say judge that person, but judge their sin. You can begin to love your enemies and love those uh, that hate you by looking at yourself. None of us, we don't want to look at ourselves in that light. We want to look at ourselves and stick our chest out and look how good, say how good we are. But to be truthful, we can see how good we are not. Another thing you must do in seeking to love your enemies is discover the good that is in them. Discover the good that is in them. Every time you begin to hate someone, realize that there is some good in them. There's some good in everyone. Look at their good points to balance their bad points. Amen. Within the best of us, there is some evil. And within the worst of us, there is some good. When you realize this, you can think differently toward that person. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every saint has a past. All you people who think that you're saints now, you had a past where you everybody was a sinner. So you had to renew your thinking, renew your mind, transform your life. And every sinner has so every sinner has a future. We all have a future. We don't, we don't know how long it may be or how far out it may be. But we all have a future. So there's someone who can be so terrible today. And tomorrow, they can be a powerful believer in Christ. Luke chapter 6, verse 32 through 34 echoes what we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and through 48, comparing to sinners. This is what it says. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. Sinners can love people who love them. The world's going to love the world. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them whom ye, you hope to receive, and what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners. To receive as much again. The lesson to love your enemies continue in Luke chapter 6 verse 35 through 36. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hope, hoping for nothing again. I mean, I've heard people say if I, if I can't afford to lose it I'm not going to loan it out. Because you become bitter when you don't get it back. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. But ye therefore be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. See, we are to be merciful to one another. We, have, we are to have compassion for our fellow man. There is a great example of this in the story of the Good Samaritan. You are familiar with the Good Samaritan? So I'm going to give you a quick history lesson about the Good Samaritan or about Samaritans. So what 
the Jews and when the Jews and the Samaritans when they intermarried, then the pure Jews they looked unto them as half breeds, as if there was a prejudice there. The Samaritans built their own temple, which the Jews say was pagan, because they weren't pure. And so the feud between the Jews and the Samaritans it grew, and the Jews hated the Samaritans, and that's why this this parable of the Good Samaritan is so important. So uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 28, it preludes the, the story I'm about to read you about the Good Samaritan. So Luke 10 says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? And he readeth, and, and how readest thou? And he and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thou thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So what did Jesus do after that? He replied, Jesus replied, that was his reply, said, you do good with your answer, but that's how you need to live, uh, by loving your neighbor as yourself. So he was showing that obtaining eternal life uh, is linked to the way you live your everyday life. That's what we're doing here on earth. We're preparing ourselves, hopefully, for eternal life. But you got to live a, a, a life that's pleasing to God now, to live an eternal life. So if you do not put God before all things and your neighbor before yourself, according to these scriptures that we have been looking at, you can have no assurance of eternal life. The fun you're having, the judgmental spirit you're having is, is going to end right here on this earth. So after his reply, the Good Samaritan parable begins. So let's read this parable. It's not too long. It's verse 29, Luke chapter 10, verse 29 through 35. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment. They took his clothes and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest. I have that underlined uh, on, on my uh, in the scripture here because I want you to I want to underline that a certain priest, a Jew, a Jew, you know that was a Jew who was who was late, who was um, who was beaten and robbed. And so another Jew passed by, a certain priest said that. Um, they came that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, another Jew, when he was at the place, uh, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who the Jews hated, they considered them to be pagan and not pure. So I uh, have breed. So this certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, where the injured Jew was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine to set him on, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So he uh, attended his wounds. You know, and then got him together and took him for a place to a place, an inn, to recover, to get better. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, "Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee." So he gave him some money to continue to take care of this wounded man. 
And he said, if uh, it costs more than what I've given you, I will repay you what, I, what is needed when I return. So after this parable, Jesus asked the following question that we will see in Luke chapter 10, verse 36 and 37. Which now of these three, talking about the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which of these three uh, was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. See, now Jesus is saying this is how we need to be. The Samaritan and Jews were enemies. But he loved his enemy. Oftentimes people will rejoice over misfortunes of their enemy. They will celebrate their misfortunes. However, scriptures tells us not to do so. Proverbs 24, 17. <coughs> Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let, let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Do not gloat when your enemy stumbles or falls. It's not a good thing. Do not let your heart rejoice over it. The Lord will see and disprove of it. Loving your enemies means seeing them as human beings. Not animals. As human beings and trying to understand them and treating them as you would treat or want them to treat you. That's we gotta treat people the way we want to be treated. That's the golden rule, right? Treat people as you want to be treated. Sometimes we need to apply the platinum rule. Treat people how they want to be treated. Love them like you would love your family, like you would love your parents, like you would love your children, and like you would love yourself. And you don't find scriptures in the Bible to tell you how to love yourself. The Bible tells us how to love others. We already know that we love ourselves and how we're going to love ourselves. But we don't, God doesn't want us to be selfish. He wants us to be selfless. Except, you've got to accept these people the way they are as unique individuals who are able to decide things on their own. So people are going to make bad decisions. People are going to do that, but we ought to accept them. I'm not saying that you condone what people do. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later. So putting yourself uh, in your enemy's shoes is one of the most effective ways to show them that you love them. And put yourself in their place, in their shoes, to look at it from their perspective. This is a worthwhile act of empathy that anyone can do at, in any situation. He says any situation. Seek to understand their side and try to understand their why. Sometimes when you find out the why of why people do certain things, then, then you can build a relationship, a bond that will maybe influence them. And I have a story, true story here. In the 1980s, a black musician named Daryl Davis set out to understand the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. He started befriending members at Klan rallies and joined an all-white uh, country band. Then he met Imperial Wizard Roger Kelly. Davis spent years building a relationship with Kelly, establishing trust and eventually a friendship. They ate meals at each other's home while Davis listened to Kelly, asking to see how Kelly could hate a person like Davis without even knowing him. We do that often. We hate people. We don't even know anything about them. But because they might be a Samaritan and we're a Jew, we hate them. Eventually, Kelly started listening to Davis and left the clan altogether. The Grand Wizard, the Grand Poobah, he listened to him and, you know, he, he realized that, hey, he's a human being just like me. So he left the clan, giving Davis his robe and his hood. And over the past 30 years, Davis was now, has now convinced over 200 former Klansmen to walk away. That's what happens when you love your enemy. So don't go and say, I can't love my enemy. But the Bible is telling us. This is what we do. And it didn't happen overnight. 
Because you don't just love them for a day. You love them for a lifetime. That's how God changes things. He uses people to change things. There's a saying. The best way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. And they credit Abraham Lincoln with this quote. I used to say this all the time. I didn't know that it was Abraham Lincoln who, who quoted it. So I found a story of an experiment on social media about what happens when you put 100 black ants and 100 red ants in a jar and shake them up. Uh, I heard that this story is accredited to Mark Twain. I saw that in some of the posts. And I have also heard that it's, uh, that it's by David Attenborough. So I don't know which one is the originator of it, but uh, this is the experiment that was done. And I also read where other people have conducted the same experiment and got the same results. And this is what it says. If you collect 100 black ants and 100 fire ants and put them in a jar, nothing will happen. Nothing's going to happen. They're in there together, cohabitating in this jar. But if you take the jar and shake it violently and leave it on the table, the ants will start killing each other. The red ants believe the black is the enemy and the black believe the red is the enemy. When the real enemy is the person who shook the jar. Now something, uh, this is the same, this can be true in society. When you have the blacks versus the whites, the men versus the women. Faith versus science, young versus old, Democrat versus Republican, etc. People who are hate because someone has shaken the jaw. Before we fight each other, we must ask ourselves who shook the jaw. Social media, a lot of times, uh, we look at that and we're going to hate somebody just because somebody else stated that they're bad or stated that we should hate them, that they're the enemy. I remember uh, Muhammad Ali watching the, those old footage where uh, they was gonna. He didn't want to go fight in Vietnam, and he said, "They're not my enemy. You my enemy. You my oppressor. You know they haven't done anything to me. You're the one who do all these bad things to me." And so the uh, the media, the government, the uh, the people were trying to convince you to hate somebody who don't even know you and you don't know them. So this is something that inter that's interesting uh, on this post. When I was reading the post, I was scrolling down looking at the comments. And one person said, uh, the white people shook the jar. After that comment, the responses snowballed from people of many faces, places, and races needing to voice that put their two cents in on this equation. And so they became... They, it's like they became a whole new experiment of their own because uh, they were killing each other with their retaliating comments. The jar had been shaken. And, I, you know, it was thousands of people. And then you go, there's a whole nother comment section about somebody else saying something about a, a certain type of people. And it was going back and forth and back and forth. This is no different from what happened with the ants. So it became clear to me that Satan shook this jar. And he, he takes forms in many ways uh, every day in this world, everywhere in this world. The devil is a puppet master. <clears throat> Stop viewing people as the enemy. I want you to walk away with something from this message today. Stop viewing people as the enemy. People are not the source of the problem. They might be a tool of the problem. They're not the source of the problem. Your battle is not with people. Your battle is with Satan behind them. The devil and the kingdom of darkness are the problem. Sin is the problem. The people you allow, uh, the, the more you allow yourself to uh, be used by the forces of evil, and you have to allow it, but the more you do it, then the more you will succumb to the sinful nature, to your sinful nature. People must forgive and bless each other and turn to God to strengthen them, um, strengthen their will against the enemy, against Satan. 
So I have a personal testimony that uh, I want to share with you uh, how instead of retaliating against someone who did me wrong, who tried to wrong me, uh, I blessed them instead, which uh, resulted in an apology, a sincere apology, and a friendship, a better friendship. An employee lied on me by saying that I sexually harassed her. Now that's serious, especially these days. So, when I learned of this, I immediately contacted my supervisor and human resources and requested that we all meet there. So, we had a meeting with my supervisor, my employee, and the human resources. And so, in the meeting, um, <clears throat> the person admitted that she made it all up because she was not happy with the evaluation that I gave her. And so, because of her disability, they just wanted to keep it a low low key and did nothing and said. And I was like, hey, I was violated. This could have went very bad for me. You know, but the thing is, is that we are to forgive, not hate our enemies, but love our enemies. So on a future date, I submitted a write-up for this employee to receive an award, and she got it. She got this award. And so afterward. She sincerely apologized with tears in her eyes and thanked me for forgiving her and, and all the things because she, her action came against my integrity because she was fueled by anger. So remember what I said, <clears throat> the best way to destroy an enemy is to make him or her your friend. You destroy that enemy. I'm going to close with a couple more things. I'm, I'm going to close with these. In Matthew chapter 5, 4 to 3, which I hope is part of what I open with. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's really not that hard. We've seen some examples. I gave you a personal testimony. We uh, saw what happened with the guy with the Klansman. Uh, we we uh, realize now that the Satan is shaking the jar. So the source of all this wickedness is not from the people. They're being used and deceived, and all this comes from Satan and wickedness. So my last quote comes from the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He says, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Let us pray. Father God, we have heard your word. We have heard the scriptures. We have heard some stories and testimonies, Lord. Lord, help, help the people who are receiving this message to truly receive it. For them to know that it is not impossible to love their enemy. Help them with that, Lord God. Help them to examine themselves. To take the beam out of their own eye. And to look at other people with compassion. Who they believe to be their enemy. Help them to win friendships through love. And not retaliate with hate. Let them know that it can be done been done in the past and it can be done tomorrow it can be done today help us oh lord help us in our unbelief help us in our unwillingness to give it a try help us to love our enemy I thank you lord god for all you have done for what you're doing right now lord i feel that you are doing something right now and for what you're going to do in the mighty name of jesus amen amen so, before I go, I just want to say, hey, if you're in the Fayetteville area, or don't mind traveling to the Fayetteville area, we have services here at Transformation Ministries at 115 Cothy Avenue in Fayetteville, Georgia, 30214, every Saturday, Saturday at noon. We start prayer at a quarter till noon at 1145 to get our minds right, you know, so that we can stay focused on the word that's about to come on the on the praise that's what we're going to do before the, the word comes. So come fellowship with us. I mean, it's always better in person. Now get out of the house.
Get out of the house and come visit with us at Transformation Ministry. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Amen. Amen.